Well, we might as well get started. Um, Okay, so can you see me? Can you hear me? Are we are we ready to go? Okay. Well, hello everybody. I'm Professor Coatman, and this meeting is about um, a, a field course that we're intending to hold this summer. Um, just before we get started, um, I'll introduce myself again. As I already said, I'm Professor Coatman. Um, I've worked in a lot of northern ecosystems. I largely work with biological invasions nowadays. We also have with us Diane Matthias, Matthias, who's our undergraduate advisor, and she can help with questions about registration and the mechanics of, of registering for the course. And Mariana, our biology assistant, who's actually, um, who's actually set up this meeting. Uh, somewhere out there are also um, Vicky Zhang and Francine De Silva. Um, they're both my graduate students. Uh, they were both at this site last year and we're hoping they're both going to be the TAs for this year. The way this meeting is going to work is I'm going to give a short presentation about the course, which I hope will answer a lot of your questions. Um, and then I'm going to be here to answer questions. We've booked this space until I think seven. Um, so if you have a question, um, you may want to ask it in the chat, or you can just hold it till the end of the presentation and I'll be fielding questions there. Um, the um, uh, okay, so with that, I am going to get going. This might take a second. Oops, just a moment. There we go. Okay, so what I hope I hope you're seeing is a full screen of my first slide. Could someone confirm that? Yes, we can see okay. it, Peter. Okay, good. I'm never quite sure. Okay, so this course is called, it's going to be listed in the calendar, it's listed in the calendar as Bio 332, Biology Field Research. Um, the way this course is going to work is that in future, um, we're going to offer it in a number of different locations with a number of different instructors. I'm hoping to offer it for the next three years or so, and we'll be doing it at the site I'm going to be talking about today. After that, it's going to pass on to another instructor who may be doing it at a different location. So this year, we're referring to it as the Arctic Field Ecology course. It'll be in the calendar as biology field research, whatever year it's offered in. But again, in future, it may occur at different locations as well. Um, there's my contact information. So I'm Department of Biology, University of Toronto, Mississauga. Um, we will post this talk online afterwards, and I'll post the slides as well. So this information should be available for you after the um, after the presentation. Okay. So just a bit about me. Um, again, if you want to look me up, there's my web page, and again, I will be posting this um, um, online. Uh, mostly nowadays, I study invasions and plant herbivore interactions, um, but I've worked in a number of systems, and in particular, I've worked in Churchill, where this course will be taking place periodically since 1984. Um, I've also worked in Western Hudson Bay, Agamiski Island in James Bay, Bylet Island, um, Southampton Island um, from about 53 to 73 North. So I've worked in a fair number of Northern systems over the years. I've also done work in a lot of um, less scenic areas like um, the, well, I shouldn't say less scenic, like the Koffler Scientific Reserve at the edge of Newmarket. So I've done a lot of work in Southern Ontario as well. So this course is going to be offered at the Churchill Northern Study Centre. Um, again, there's its own web page. I'll just show you where it is. On the map, the red dot here is Churchill, Manitoba, which, as you'll see in a moment, is a town on Hudson Bay in northern Manitoba, just south of the Nunavut border. 
Um, Churchill has been a center for research for many years, and in particular, it's home to the CNSC here. Um, here's a picture of the building. It's a lovely new center. It's only about 10 years old, I think. Um, here's a picture of the interior on the right. It's really a nice, comfortable place to hold a field course. Um, it's spacious. Um, they have a cafeteria there. Um, the, um, they have rooms um, which are shared accommodation. We have four people in a room. It's where I'm going to be doing most of my research in the next few years. So I'm actually going to be staying here, hopefully as of June of this, this year. Okay. Churchill is a small place. Um, it's about 25 kilometers um, west of the, uh, of the study center. So the study center is right at the end of the road. It's a small town, about 900 residents. Um, although it's a big town by Northern standards, it's the biggest place and I think about 250 kilometers in any direction. Um, again, there is a town there. Um, there's an airport, which is one of the access points. Historically, it's interesting. Um, it was a Hudson Bay Company post starting in 1717. Um, so it's got a long history of contact between European and native peoples. Um, and it's been a center for trade and, and travel for, for most of that period. It's also a grain port. You can see this huge grain elevator in the background, which means that there's a train line to the city. And as I'll mention in a few minutes, the two ways to get here are by train or by flying. Uh, there's no road connection with the outside world, so those are your two ways for getting there. Um, although it's small, it actually does have a lot of amenities, especially for a northern town. So it does have a grocery store, a hardware store, a liquor store, souvenir shops, restaurants. Uh, very helpfully for us, it's got a hospital um, in case of medical emergencies. So it's actually a fairly forgiving place to go by northern standards. So how do you get there? Well, that's your first challenge. Um, the way that this course works, um, I'll mention costs in a few minutes, but we expect you to arrange your own transportation. Um, there are several different ways that you can actually book a ticket there. Um, the usual way is you fly to Winnipeg. Um, and again, there's several carriers that go to Winnipeg on a daily basis. Then you fly from Winnipeg to Churchill on a small local airline, Comair International. Um, Comair is small um, and um, it's actually not on the big travel aggregators. So if you search for it on Travelocity or Expedia, you're not gonna see it. You have to book a ticket through Comair directly. Currently there are four Comair flights a week. And the reason is they're still running on a reduced um, COVID schedule. They haven't posted the summer schedules yet, um, but I'm hoping by the time the course happens, they'll be doing daily flights again. Um, the aircraft aren't especially small. In fact, in a normal year, they actually run 737s up there um, on a daily basis. So I'm hoping that tickets will be more available um, by the time that we need to fly. Uh, just as an aside, in most years, some flights go through Rankin Inlet in Nunavut and then actually turn around and come back to Churchill, um, which is a really interesting trip if you actually wind up on that flight. You don't get to spend long in Rankin, but it's an interesting addition. The other thing you can do is get yourself to Winnipeg and then take a passenger train. So they do run um, uh, tourist trains up from Winnipeg, um, I think on a daily basis. Oh, no, sorry, not on a daily basis, um, several times a week. Um, the, um, be warned that it's, it's, it's an interesting trip, and we often have students do it, but it's a multi-day trip. It winds up taking, uh, I think, something like 46 hours over three days. So it's a significant time investment, but uh, some people do definitely find it worth it. If you register for the course, I am going to be sending more details on travel information and other tips um, at that time. At this point, I just want to give you the sort of basic picture. Okay. So when you get to Churchill, um, what do you see? Well, one of the reasons we like holding the course here is that it's right at the edge of the tundra. Um, Churchill is pretty much a tree-lined town. So 
There are plenty of accessible habitats like the left here. This is good quality coastal tundra. Um, again, easily accessible from the CNSC. But we're very close to the tree line. So if you look on the right hand side, there also is northern boreal forest available. That means we actually, although we call the course the Arctic field course, we actually split it between these habitats. So you get to see boreal and tree line habitats while you're, while you're actually there. It's a coastal environment. We're only a few kilometers from Hudson Bay. Um, so again, we also spend a lot of time on or near the coast. Finally, this is a really wet landscape. This is basically a northern extension of the Great Plains. Um, it's very flat. It's a permafrost environment. There are lots of wetlands and many lakes. Um, again, you'll hear, I'm, I'm basically a plant biologist. You'll hear lots about plants when you're up there, but this is the kind of thing to expect. Um, the few trees are things like black spruce, white spruce, tamarack. The trees in the foreground here are white spruce that have been stunted by uh, probably several hundred years of the environment. These are very old trees. Um, tundra dominated by heath and lichens, peatlands and sedge fens. One nice thing about being at the southern edge of the tundra is that by northern standards, it's actually quite a diverse habitat. So there's a real range of things we can look at during the course. In terms of wildlife, um, the area has got a diverse bird community and a lot of typical Arctic and subarctic birds. Things like snow geese, the ones on the left here, I've, I've worked with these birds extensively. Ptarmigan, parasitic Jaegers, shorebirds, lots of songbirds. It's also good for mammals, including things like beluga whales. We often see caribou, Arctic foxes, and polar bears are locally common. Um, especially in August when we're going to be there. Um, I'm going to probably say this more than once during the talk, but I will give you one warning. Um, if you really are going on this course to see polar bears, go on a wildlife tour instead. You'll be guaranteed to see one. There are really good tour outfits in Churchill. Um, I can recommend one. We usually do see bears on the, on, the, on the course, and we certainly try to, but it's not guaranteed. This is a field course, not a wildlife viewing expedition. So we do our best, but please remember, it's not the primary purpose of the course. Again, I've mentioned that for hundreds of years, this has been a contact point between Cree, Dene, Inuit, and Europeans. Um, there actually are quite a lot of good, well, there's several good local museums and um, um, uh, sources of art in the town. Um, so again, there's a good, a good National Parks Museum, which we'll certainly visit. There's an excellent museum of Inuit art. Um, across the river, there's also the Hudson Bay Company's um, Prince of Wales Fort. Um, this is a huge 18th century star fort in the middle of absolute nowhere. Um, you'll see it for sure. We currently have not scheduled a trip there, but you'll get at least one or two days off during the course. and you potentially can arrange trips there at that point if you want. So how does the course work? Well, the first thing is that field courses are intensive. You don't get a lot of spare time during this course. Um, so um, we work nearly every day. We usually take a couple of days off, <clears throat> but most days are pretty full schedules. The usual pattern is that in the morning and after, in the morning and afternoon, we do local trips to local habitats. We look at biology, we look at wildlife, we talk about Arctic ecology. After dinner, um, at least in the first half of the course, you'll actually get a lecture on um, some aspect of Arctic or boreal ecology. Most of them will by, be by me, but one nice thing about being at a research center is that there are lots of researchers passing through and if there's somebody interesting going through, we try to parasitize them and bribe them with beer or something to do a lecture. So we've got a good history of getting local researchers and local people to fill in as well. Um, the evaluation for the course is pretty straightforward. Um, it's gonna be a combination of quizzes. So you get quizzes on things like local, local biodiversity, plant identification. Um, you um, are gonna to have to do a short project during the course. 
Um, so you'll have about three days to do a to a to a project, cut data for a project. So we ask people to do a presentation about what their project is about, and then um, then collect data and actually write up the project. Um, there is a report due after the end of the course. So during the course itself, we limit it to quizzes, presentations, talking to the group. After the course is over, sometime in the fall, you'll need to submit a formal written report based on your, uh, on your data collection. Okay. Um, a little about the about physical conditions. Um, one real advantage of doing it in late July and August is that conditions tend to be pretty nice. Um, usually mosquitoes and black flies are mostly gone by that time. Um, they're abundant in the spring, but they dry up over the summer. I got to tell you, last year was an exception. Last year, we had lots of mosquitoes right till the day I left, but most years were luckier than that. Daily mean temperatures are comfortable. Um, they're um, a day, good daily average is about 12 degrees. So not really warm, not really cold. You need a coat, but you certainly don't experience extremely cold temperatures. In fact, I looked it up, and as far as I can tell, Churchill has never recorded snow in July or August. Um, it's like fall in Ontario. Um, however, you can get days close to zero. We had some last year that I think were down to about three by the time we left. Um, you need to be prepared for that kind of conditions. It's also a rainy and foggy environment. We get lots of rain, lots of coastal fog. If conditions are really bad, we stay in the center that day. But it's a short course and we can't afford to stay there very long. So do expect to work in rain while you're there. Um, one unusual aspect of the course, again, is that there are some hazards we have to deal with. Um, I'll just mention again, polar bears are one thing that structures whatever we do up there. Um, there are a lot of bears up there and you'll be hearing about them during the course in detail. It does put restrictions on what we can do. So you, know, you can't go out alone, you can't go out at night. Um, your TAs and I all have firearms licenses, we're all trained as bear guards and we may hire additional guards during the course. Um, but certainly there are some rules you really do have to follow during this course. We get bears in the parking lot. They actually get bears in the building next door one year. So there really is a lot of caution. We, you have to closely supervise you, not because we don't trust you, but because it's an environment where none of us, myself included, can just walk wherever we want. Again, there will be some other opportunities. We'll spend at least a day in Churchill. Um, Again, looking at some of the museums and other sites, um, there are a number of very good local tour companies. Um, so if on a day off you want to visit the fort or go kayaking in the river, um, you can do that. Um, I'll especially mention whale tours. Um, at that time of year, there will be hundreds of beluga whales in the river. And there are a couple of very good whale tour outfits that will take you out and tour you around them. Again, at this point, it's an extra for the course, but it's certainly, it's reasonably affordable and certainly well worth doing if that's the kind of thing that interests you. If it isn't, I guarantee you can see whales from the shore. I don't usually guarantee a wildlife, but um, this is one that I think you're definitely going to see. Now, here comes the catch. The main problem is that this is an expensive course. And I wish it weren't, but there's just no way we can get around this. Field courses tend to be costly, and this is no exception. Um, you'll need to pay about $1,200 room and board to the study center. That pays for um, your room while you're there. That also pays for all meals while you're there. Um, I have to say it's expensive, but good value. For that kind of latitude, this is a really cheap rate for a Northern Research Center. Um, you will have to pay a deposit in advance, We're working on the details of that now. We also do ask people to buy their own tickets to get to the site, and that's really the expensive part. Um, last year, it cost about 500 bucks to get to Winnipeg and about 1,700 more to get to Churchill return. Um, I am hoping prices may go down a bit this summer as things open up after COVID, but we just don't know. Um, Calm Air again hasn't actually published, whoops, hasn't actually published their schedule yet. 
The good news is that there is some financial support. Um, there will be bursaries for um, UTM students from the Experiential Learning Office. Um, they've said that they're hoping to provide up to 500 bucks for students who can demonstrate financial need um, and possibly more in, in some in cases with greater need. Um, I've also been told the biology department possibly might top this up as well, but there's no official word on that yet. We're, I think we're waiting for our annual budget. Um, I'm just putting this up right now. We literally got notified officially today that these, these bursaries will be available. Um, again, we don't do them. You have to go through the bursaries office, but I'll include this slide in the talk. Um, that should give you the link you need to get in touch with them. For bursaries, the application period is between May 2nd and 15th. So if you're interested in the bursary, you need to apply in that period. I can also give you a few travel tips. And again, for those who are registered in the course, I can give you more advice as well. Um, again, you can get relatively cheap flights to Winnipeg, um, about 500 bucks. Um, the expensive part is really getting from Winnipeg to Churchill. The good news is that Comair inexplicably accepts both Air Canada frequent flyer miles and air miles, um, which can really reduce the cost. I took my whole family up there a couple of years ago, just on Air Canada miles. Um, even stranger, they accept them at par. And even stranger, they actually consider Churchill to be a local flight. Um, it's gotta be one of the best buy or best deals you can get on frequent flyer miles. Um, there also are student fairs, apparently, that are available if you're under 24. Um, I don't know anything about them myself, but the Calm Air site says to contact them if you're in that age group. When you book flights, you should make sure your ticket is flexible as possible. Um, flights in the north often do get delayed, and it can be a real problem. Um, make sure you've got lots of time for connections. Um, I'd budget at least three or four hours in Winnipeg, especially on the way back. Um, it's not uncommon for calm air to be significantly late. Um, I once got stuck in Churchill for three days because of high winds. So whatever ticket class you get, get the one that gives you the most flexibility. You can save quite a bit of money by taking the train from Winnipeg. You can actually save about a thousand bucks um, if you're willing to take the train. But as I said, it's a major time commitment. And also that just pays for a seat. If you want like a sleeping car, that costs a lot more. But if you think you could really sit in a seat for three days, you can save a lot of money. I gotta say every year we get students who do that. Um, there are other creative ways of getting there as well. Um, we've had people actually drive to Winnipeg and fly from there. I think we want someone had to drive to Gillum, Manitoba, which is the absolute end of the road network and catch the train there. So there can be other creative ways of reducing costs as well. Okay. Um, deadlines and, and other information. Um, we're planning to open enrollment on March 17th uh, with a deadline on April 8th. Um, it's possible that might still change a bit. Um, there are minimal prerequisites for the course. Again, we're just asking for six credits and registration and basically a biology related program. But we, but it is by permission of the instructor. So you actually have to submit a little application. I look through them and I try to decide um, uh, who's most qualified for the course. Um, the, um, um, if you're coming from another university, you can um, enroll. You need, um, a, oh, what is it, a letter of permission. Um, and we'll adjust the prerequisites accordingly. So as long as you're in this basic kind of program, you're fine. Um, admission is not directly through, um, I, I said Quercus, I guess just through the admission system. Um, instead, what we're gonna ask is for you to submit a CV, an unofficial transcript, and a short paragraph, just a few lines explaining why you want to take the course. Um, we've set up a couple of websites for you where you can actually submit your application. 
And it does matter if you're a U of T student, there's one site. If you're coming from another university, there's a different site because there are slightly different rules that apply. Okay. Um, so again, if you look for it in the registrar's um, page, it's not going to let you register at this point. You have to apply through the, um, the forms and students who are approved for the course, we can then register. Okay. Um, again, contacts for the course. Well, your basic contact is me. Uh, I'm leading the course. Um, I've also taught earlier versions of this course four times in the past. Um, just for the record, we're reviving it. We haven't offered this since 2007, so we're bringing it back at this point. But I have a lot of experience on the site, a lot of experience teaching the course, and I can answer most questions about the course itself, the environment, the location. For registration questions, please contact Diane. Um, she could help you with the mechanics of registering with requirements involved and any problems that you may encounter. So that's the basic information. Uh, I will tell you it's a course I really enjoy teaching. I think it's fair to say the students have all really enjoyed it. It's a fantastic environment. You see interesting things. I'll also say that for Canadians, I think this is something that all of us should do at some point, not necessarily take my field course, but so much of our country is a Northern country. Half of our country is under permafrost. Yet so few of us ever actually visit the site. If you want to see what Northern Canada really looks like, this is a good entry point for anyone who's interested. Having said that, this is usually where, well, this is where the formal presentation ends, but I will take a few minutes and show you some of the kinds of things we do actually see on the site. So these are all just pictures I've taken in the last few years um, in July and August, and the time period will be up there. Um, so let's take a look. So for example, this is cotton grass. This is an Arctic sedge, really important species ecologically. Um, the berries behind it are cloud berries, which are delicious. Um, oh, the study center itself is actually at a former rock, scientific rocket launching base. So one thing I didn't mention is that it does have a sort of weird environment. Um, it's a lovely study center, but it's surrounded by things like this. Um, so it's... Um, it's an interesting piece of local history. Just a bald eagle along the road. Again, it's sitting on these just stunted um, north of tree line trees, Crumholtz trees. There's an aurora from last year. Um, this is a terrific site for seeing auroras um, if the sky is clear. We get a lot of cloudy nights, but any night the sky is clear, it's worth looking. That's Spiranthes romanzoffiana. That's actually an orchid. It's one of the relatively few orchids that grow at that latitude. It's everywhere. These are snow geese. Um, these are Arctic breeding geese. There's a major colony um, about 20 kilometers to the um, east of where the CNSC is. Um, they have boom and bust years. Um, in a good year, we will see these around town, especially also around the study center. Um, but it depends on the weather that year. And some years they just get wiped out by bad conditions. That's just a red fox in our parking lot. Um, this is actually the contact zone between red foxes and Arctic foxes. And there seems to be a lot of competition between them. Um, as climate warms, it's possible that red foxes may drive Arctic foxes further north in the future. That's what they used to call an Arctic loon, and they now call it Pacific loon. This is not the loon that we get in southern Ontario. It's an Arctic breeding species. Um, there are all the little lakes around the site. And as I mentioned, this is a really a wetland area. Um, so these are really pretty much everywhere. There's a willow ptarmigan, um, the chicken of the north. Um, these guys turn white in winter, uh, but in summer they adopt this brown coat. Um, they're quite common around the study center, but secretive. Um, usually we do see some. Um, they also have an absolutely hilarious call. I recommend looking it up. Just a nice piece of coastal tundra uh, close to the study center. Uh, again, not a tree in sight in this one. You can see a few, short, a few willows on the, in the background there. Here's an actual tree line site. So in the foreground, you've got pulses, which are permafrost features. They're permafrost cord mounds. 
In the background, you actually have um, mostly white spruce forest beginning. It looks like there's some black spruce in there as well. Um, that's a Hudsonian godwit. This is a shorebird that breeds vocally. Um, it's got a very restricted distribution. Um, um, there are a few colonies between Churchill and Alaska. The total world population is a few tens of thousands of birds. It's actually an endangered species. Well, and then there are these guys. Um, these actually helpfully showed up at one of our experiments last year and actually managed to walk through it. Um, like I say, it's something we do have to be constantly vigilant about. It's great to see them, but they are a hazard that we have to prepare for. And that's it for the presentation. Um, I'm going to unshare my screen. Um, Diane, I don't know if there's anything you want to add at this point. Yeah, I can um, just share my screen briefly with a few uh, yeah, enrollment do. dates, some enrollment information. Thanks, Mariana. So um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of um, information about um, enrollment. So um, there are two separate dates for uh, enrollment. Um, for as you can see here, um, you can find important dates on the UTM registrar's page about actual dates, but um, for UTM students, enrollment for UTM students will begin on March 16th. Um, and the deadline to apply for OSAP is March 31st, and the deadline to pay summer tuition fees is May the 4th. And for non-degree or visiting students who are interested in, the, uh, in taking the course, enrollment date for the non-degree and visiting students will begin on March the 17th. Um, you will need to apply to uh, the registrar's office for an LOP, a letter of permission. Uh, and that deadline will be April the 18th. So anybody who's not a UTM student, you will need to apply for an LOP before you can take the course. Um, I've posted the link there where you can uh, apply for the LOP program. And the deadline for tuition fees is the same uh, as UTM students, it'll be May the 4th. So as Peter mentioned, uh, students who are interested in the course, we do have some prerequisites. Um, I doubt this will be available um, or open to first year students unless you are a transfer credit student coming to our university for the first year. So if you've, if you've um, completed some, some credits at another university and you were in a biology or an ecology, environment, geography, or earth science program previously at another university and you are transferring to UTM, you can be considered. But if you are a UTM student in your first year, uh, you probably would not have the prerequisites for this course simply because you also need to have some, um, have completed a 200 level stats course in order to be successful in this course. And most first year students would not have completed that. Um, so again, you just, you need to have a minimum of six credits you need to be registered in a biology program, ecology and environment, geography or earth science program, um, or a combination of those programs is fine. And yes, you do need a 200 level stats course in order to be successful. So as Peter mentioned, um, students do not apply through the registrar's office at all. Um, anybody who's interested in taking the course, you'll need to submit your information to the links provided. Um, and we can post this on the UTM website, as Mariana has mentioned. Um, you'll need to submit an unofficial transcript, uh, a CV, and as 
um, Peter mentioned just a very short per paragraph explaining why you're interested in taking the course. Um, we will be checking with all the students just to make sure that your LOPs have been approved if you're a non-UTM student before we enroll you into the course. Um, once you've been selected, we will send you an email and let you know that you've been selected for the course. And uh, as Mariana mentioned, we will provide the links below where you can upload all of your documentation. Could I just interject for one moment? Um, yeah. One thing that's helpful on your CV is if you've had any experience in remote areas or field situations, please tell me. It's not a prerequisite for the course, yeah. but we do like to know that people have some idea of what they're getting into. And if you have had some experience like that and you've enjoyed it, please let me know. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, we also just wanted to mention that, um, you know, this is, this is a research course and there, there may be students who are not comfortable with um, being outside around bugs and mosquitoes all day, for example, or other things like that. So you really have to be um, there to do the research and are interested in, in the course topic and not there for sort of just to see polar bears. <laughs> because there may be some students who get there and realize that it's not, you know, maybe your bed is not going to be comfortable or things like that. So you really have to take everything into consideration. And Mariana, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, and as Peter had mentioned, um, there will be some bursaries uh, available to UTM students who feel that they um, can demonstrate a financial need to take the course. Uh, the deadline that students need to apply by is uh, May the 2nd, between May 2nd and May the 15th. So that is the deadline to apply for the bursaries and the applications can be sent to the Experiential Learning Office through U of TME.EL bursaries. Uh, next. And that is my contact information. If any of you um, need to ask me any additional questions or Peter, feel free to email us. Thank you. I was just gonna ask Mariana, I'd like to make the um, the presentation and also my slides available. Um, I can post the, my, and also actually Diane's slides. Um, I can post my own slides on my web page for starters, but can we put a link on the biology page or something like that? Somewhere that makes it easy for students to find? Yeah, we, uh, there is a page for this course. Uh, we'll put all the links in the, sli in the slides and the mm -hmm. uh, link to YouTube channel and so on. Okay. Everything is gonna be there. Okay. Visit okay. our website. Mm -hmm. It is that is that course linked to our website? Is the course linked in our website already? Is it? How do students find it? I think so. It's uh, on the new courses. I'll I'll take a look right now. Okay. Okay. So let's see. Um, so I, I think we fielded a lot of the questions that have been asked. Um, if you have more, just ask me. Um, you can type it in the chat or just turn on your microphone, that's fine. Um, what's the acceptance rate for the course? Um, well, you know, we don't really know. Um, we have space for about 20 students and that's a hard limit because we're limited by the amount of space available at the study center. Um, so that's how many we'll be accepting. The rate of acceptance is gonna depend how many people apply. It looks like we had about 40 people here today. Um, but we'll just have to wait and see. Peter, there was one question from um, one of the students. They were asking if they arrived, if they mm -hmm. happened to arrive at the center prior yeah. to the start of the course, would they be able to stay there or not? Probably. Um, what you need to do is you need to contact the study center directly. Um, so if you go to the link that I gave you, there's contact information there and you need to ask them. Um, if they have space available, yes, you can stay. They'll charge you for it. It's like 80 bucks a day or something like that. Um, but you can stay, you can arrive early and you can also stay longer if you want. We've had students do that. As long as space is available, um, the study center is a busy place and 
you know, some years just every bed is actually full. So you need to arrange that with them in advance. We have had students do that though. We've had people arrive early, we've had people stay late. And I think we had a group one year that went off on a canoe trip down the Copper Mine River when the course was over. Let's see, sorry, I'm trying to catch up. Well, preference given to students who yet to complete a research project or a field course. You know, I haven't really thought of that one. Um, the, um, yeah, I don't think I want to answer that right now. I'm going to have to think about that. But I will say in your application, when you are writing your paragraph, um, if you want to make a case and say that this is my first chance to take a field course or something like that, you can write it down and I'll, I'll think about it. Um, one thing I should mention is that if we if we do happen to have a few UTM students that really, really need the course to graduate, uh, we may have to give a few preference spots yeah. to those students. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any other questions? Mm -hmm. I will say one thing you will see during the course is you'll get a chance to take a look at the research we're actually doing up there. I mean, we refer to this as a field research experience, which is a little misleading. I mean, really what it is is a field course where we introduce you to the local ecosystems. But we are going to show you our own research and possibly get you to participate in some aspects of it. Um, we're working on rather an unusual project at the moment. Um, we're looking at invasive species in, in and around the town of Churchill, invasive plants. There are very few invaders at northern latitudes, but Churchill's recorded a fair number because it's a grain port. In fact, we actually found a new one today. Um, we're interested in whether in future these are going to represent a threat to the local environment. So you'll be seeing the experiments that we're doing with that. Um, so someone has put into the chat, are UTSG students considered outside university? Um, it, it, it is the same. So UTM students would all, will always have priority enrollment, um, usually in, this, in most courses. Um, but in this case, we are kind of just allowing students to submit their applications um, all at the same time. Um, so it, it really depends on your, your, uh, your academic experience and any previous experience you've had in research. Um, but to answer your question, uh, UTSG students will be considered um, at the same time as everyone else. Do they need any special permission, like a letter of permission, or do they just... No, UTS... Okay. Uh, uh, UT, uh, UTSG or Scarborough students do not need a letter of permission. Okay. Only non, uh, non U of T or a visiting student would need an LLP. If you're in your second degree, do you acquire, do I need just your current CV? Um, well, usually CVs are cumulative, so it'll, oh, transcript. Okay, that makes more sense. Um, um, it, it depends if your second degree is relevant. So what I mean by that is um, if, you're, if your first degree, I guess if your first degree was in science, uh, in any way, biology or science, geography, environment, um, then we would need to see the, the unofficial transcript from your first degree. Because um, I'm not sure if you're doing a second degree at U of T um, and it's not science, then we would need to see what your first degree was. Uh, is the internet re connection reliable in Churchill? Um, <laughs> yes, 
Actually, the answer surprisingly is yes. Um, the, um, there's an organization called Polar Bears International, which has a headquarters there. And they, they actually use the study center to monitor um, radio colored polar bears and that kind of thing. And because of that, they actually installed this really good internet um, connection. So there's good internet and there's also good cell phone service, except it's patchy. Even within the study center, there are corners where you don't get it, but where you do get it, it's surprisingly fast and reliable. Hmm. You should also be able to get um, cell phone service in town. Um, there's probably internet service available there as well. Peter, I'm not sure. Did we mention the, the start date of the course? I can't remember. Oh, I, I forget if we did or not. It was on a slide. It'll be um, June 20, or sorry, July 27th to August 10th. Yeah. Um, and those are the official court, uh, court dates. Those are the official course <laughs> dates. Um, there is a little bit of wiggle room there. And the reason I'm saying that is that we don't know the summer flight schedules yet. So if you can only get there a day late or something like that, we'll, we'll sort it out. Will there be a course wait list? I assume so. Um, I mean, we can keep one ourselves regardless of the official wait list. We do sometimes yeah. get people dropping out, although I'll remind you that there is a deposit you have to pay. So you may lose money if you register and then, then drop out. Yeah. Um, the only thing with this is, though, is that we are limited in the number of students that we can take so mm -hmm. that um, if we do find that we have the number of students chosen, then we probably would not have a wait list simply because we wouldn't be able to take any more students in the course. Okay. Can I tell you more about research done on invasive wildlife? Oh, yeah, can I? Um, the... Um, I don't think I'm going to do it here because I'll be talking for hours. <laughs> um, if you're a U of T student, um, come and visit my office sometime and we can talk. Um, um, there's not a lot of work on in invaders going on up there. Um, there's relatively, there are very few invaders at high latitudes at, at the moment. Um, Churchill is really an odd exception. But it's recognized as an emerging problem. So there's real fear that with climate change, it's gonna become much more of an issue in future. So we're trying to get there ahead of the curve and take a look at you know, the kind of things that may be happening as temperature continues to warm. Will there be any course preparation and lectures before being in the field? No, we do this entirely as a field course. Um, there may be preparation you want to do. Um, so one thing I will do is I will put together um, a list of helpful resources, books, websites, etc. again, for people actually taking the course. And you may want to look at it uh, before you come up. But as far as I'm concerned, the course starts on July 27th. So that's when you need to be there and ready to go. Mentioned quizzes, how often they be given? I haven't decided yet. Um, You'll get at least one, you might get two. Um, it's only a two week course, so you can work it out yourself there. Um, we usually have one quiz um, near the end of the course that's focused on identifying things that we've seen and explaining them. So, you know, I can ask you, what is this plant? I can ask you, why is this plant important? Um, um, but yeah, expect one or, expect one or two. What kind of student research projects have been done in the past? We've had a really wide range. Um, what are some good ones? Um, there's a really common carnivorous plant up there, um, common butterwort. Um, um, and you can actually, it catches insects on the leaves. And we've had a bunch of students look at um, things relating to that. 
um, what habitats they capture insects in, whether plants that are flowering capture more insects, that kind of thing. Um, we had a project one year where someone was looking at frogs. Um, we, um, there's a fairly common um, um, frog up there, northern chorus frog. Actually, there are two. There's also wood frog. Um, they were interested in whether there was habitat matching going on between frogs and the habitats that they're in. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're there. Um, we, um, we had an excellent project one year. I encouraged the student to publish this and they never did. And I'm sad they didn't, but there's a very, very brightly colored lichen, um, um, Xanthoria, um, which is common up there. It's brilliant orange. And this student was actually a chemistry major and they had an idea that the bright orange pigment was actually a UV protective pigment. Um, they actually measured uh, pigment concentrations in lichens that were in exposed sites and shaded sites. And lo and behold, found the difference. Ones that were in exposed sites had higher pigment concentrations. Um, the main, the key of it is you only get maybe three days to collect data. So from the moment you get there, you need to be thinking about what might make a good course. We'll help you, we'll help guide you with that. But it obviously can't be a 10 year study of common eiders or something. It has to be something where you can collect data in a few days. There's also not a lot of equipment up there. Um, we will, there will be microscopes, there will be certain basic lab equipment, but this is an Arctic field site. So if you've got a project that you know, depends on doing um, HPLC or something, uh, maybe you should rethink that. But um, I gotta say every year we get a good selection. I don't think we've ever had someone stuck for a project. There's always something that you can you can do. Okay. Uh, when will these PowerPoint presentations be uploaded? Um, I'm gonna upload mine to my webpage as soon as we're done here. Um, and I'll send, send um, Mariana a copy. Um, I presume in the next few days. Um, you can go through the bio, the biology department webpage. There probably will be a, a link there. Um, um, if you have trouble finding them, just give me an email me in a few days and I'll, I'll tell you what's going on. Uh, will the marks count for the transcript? Absolutely. This is an official university course. It's in the course calendar. Um, um, yeah, no, this counts. Well, are we already online here? Let's see. No, we are not online, but I just showed okay. uh, everybody how they get to the page with the course. Okay. And I'll upload it tomorrow morning. Okay. I'm going to send you a slightly updated uh, version of the, of, the, of the ad for it in a moment. And I can send you the, um, um, my actual talk in a few minutes as well. Okay, are there any more questions? Peter, I can send you the slides, my slides as well. And then if you want, you can send both together. Okay, okay, that would be great. Okay. Okay, well, what are protocols like you to look with, be like with COVID? Who knows? Um, <laughs> we are assuming at this point, given the trends that we've got that um, protocols will be at least somewhat relaxed. Last year in the center, we were working there. We did have to wear masks um, in public areas, uh, maintain distance. It wasn't that different from university regulations, um, but we could certainly work with that. And that was really at the peak of the pandemic. So I'm hoping this year will be better. But, you know, I probably should say, um, as with everything else, this does depend on COVID. You know, if we have a massive new outbreak, um, you know, in mid in mid July, then we're in trouble. So let's hope that doesn't happen. Okay. Well, thank you all for attending. If you have a question, get it in now, because I think it sounds like we're about to uh, shut down. 
Um, you're also most welcome to email me if you've got questions, um, follow-up questions as well. And I'll either answer them or direct you to somebody who can. Okay. Okay, Diane, Mariana, it looks like we're shutting down here. So thank you very much. Um, I'll, um, I'm gonna put a link on my webpage to, to this talk in a few minutes, but, and again, there hopefully will be a biology link as well. Um, I'm sure I'll be talking to you in the next, next few days. What other <laughs> courses do I teach? Plant ecology, third year plant ecology is the main one at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Mariana, for helping. Yeah.